So we're here today at uh, June the 22nd's Porsche Day at uh, Bewley um, on the estate of Lord, uh, Lord Montague. I'm here with Paul Lacey and Vince Dallimore of 928.org of Porsche Club Great Britain and also TIPEC, the Independent Porsche Enthusiast Club. And we're going to talk a little bit about actual the realities of, of buying and owning the prices and what to look for. So Paul, first off, you know, let's not talk typically about specific cars, but if you just walked around and we're here in front of a, a very attractive Amazon Green 928 GT, it's a rare car produced for I believe a couple of years, it's a, a rare manual car, although all GTs were manual. So just walk us around the car, if somebody's out this weekend thinking, right, I've seen on, on eBay or some other site, uh, Exchange Mart or some classic car site, they fancy a 928, what should they be looking at and what should they definitely be walking away if they see one of these, these indicators? Well, number one is to look at the service history to make sure that it's been looked after. Um, uh, the price doesn't matter as long as it's regular servicing and that preferably it's done by somebody that you recognise, not Joe Blob's garage. And uh, that's the first thing to check the paperwork, always. If you've got any doubts about that, walk away. Um, the next thing is to look round the body. Now the front wings... Take us through, we'll actually have a little look around and point to the things yep. that we should be concerned about. The front wings and the doors are aluminium and they do get, tend to get bubbling, not on this car, but they get bubbling under the paint, which is just where moisture gets between the paint and the aluminium. And it produces this white powder which pushes the paint away. Now that's not something to be too worried about. Most 928s will have bubbling around the wheels, uh, arches, around the mirrors and places like that. And um, so if you have that and it's not too bad, don't worry too much because it's not like steel which will rust through and give you holes, it can be fixed. I've seen cars with bubbling around here though in front of the, uh, in front of the windscreen, is that a yep. particular concern? No, this is a steel panel and it does rust, but that panel is completely separate to the rest of the body. So it's easy to replace or fix. Is, is that a windscreen out job? No, no, it just unbolts with these bolts here. Right. And two screws hidden under the trim. So it just comes out. A bit like a big Meccano set then, Paul, really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so walking around, I mean, clearly, I mean, the, the latter cars have got these, uh, these side strips. And I've seen many earlier cars, and indeed later cars where they've taken the strips off, where maybe they've gone to Tesco and sadly they've ended up having a bit of a ding. So are we looking mm. for, you know, parking and um, car park? bodywork damage to the, the flanks and the doors? Uh, not so much the doors, but you need to be aware or to pay particular attention to anything in terms of corrosion from the back of the doors backwards. That's all steel. It's galvanised steel, so it shouldn't rust. But they do rot uh, where mud gets thrown up underneath the wings and collects and it rots from the inside out. And that's the problem. If it rots from the inside out, by the time you see it, is so that's a, that's a, is that a walk away or is that a let's be very concerned? You need to look very, very closely at exactly how much remedial work is required to fix it. Am I right in thinking there was an oddity uh, with the, when Porsche sold the cars that they had a wheel liner on the driver's side, but on the passenger side they didn't come as standard with a liner on the rear wheel? It's correct. Um, there is a plastic liner inside the wings, front and back, and there's a gap, basically, about that large at the back of the uh, driver's side and a smaller one on the passenger side, depending on the model. Uh, and that allowed all this mud and salt and muck to get up inside the, the back of the wings, uh, which is... And why, you know, bear in mind Porsche all about design and engineering excellence. Why on earth did they build in that, uh, that potentially fatal um, trap for some of the older cars? Well, I would only presume that they were relying on the galvanising of, uh, of the metal and the fact that people were not going to be looking at them as we are when they're 30 years old. Yeah. And so... Um, Let's walk around the back then because we've got these, these wonderful... At the time, you know, they came out in 1977. This was the era of the Ford Cortina and, uh, you know, perhaps some of the remnants of... Uh, the cars that we grew up with, with our parents driving, Hillman Avengers and Hillman Hunters and goodness as well. And then we have this car appearing in 1977, the one car, the European car of the year, I think it was 1978. And we've got a polyurethane, I believe, 
rear bumper. So at the time, it was a bit like something from UFO or Space 1999 Mars. from Mars. Thank you, Vince. What are we looking at in terms of the uh, the rear panel here, Paul? Well, the front and rear panels are um, some type of plastic polyurethane. And uh, they, the 928 was the first car in the world to have these. And there is an aluminium beam bumper, as you would describe a bumper, behind uh, that. But it can take low speed impacts and just spring back to the original position. Now we're not about to do that today, but no. if you were to push in a, a 9 to 8 bumper, especially oh. on a summer's day today, now yeah, Paul, somebody waving at you, you're clearly famous beyond <laughs> what we're doing today, they will actually pop out, won't they? Yes. So yeah, gentle pressure. Back, yeah. yeah. So let's have a look at the, uh, the business end, shall we? Let's look at the engine and let's just talk us through some of the basics that anybody who's uh, not an engineer or mechanic can actually think, right, that's not a great car. Mm. Let's, let's look at the front, at the shark end, as they call it in America, and see what we can see. Okay. Look at the silver one. This car is obviously not in bad shape. And I would immediately notice a few things. The tyres are worn badly on the outside. That means there's something not right with the steering. That's just something that you just notice. Or, or has it got the right wheels on the first place? Well, you know, that's another question. Um, wheels often, often get changed and uh, often the wrong wheels are fitted to 928s. They need a specific what's called offset on the front wheels, otherwise the steering is all sloppy and it follows lines in the roads and so on. And unfortunately the 928 has a a quite unique uh, front offset on the on the wheels so if you just buy some Porsche wheels stick them on from a Boxster for example then uh, they're not going to work properly. So the mantra has to be stick with the original or get proper advice from Porsche themselves or a specialist who really does know what they're talking about rather than somebody who just wants to sell you some big bling bling rims and some rubber band tyres, yeah? That's it, yep. So what have we got under the bonnet? What are we looking at here? So, right, so this is an S4. It's, it's quite complex, isn't it? It is quite complex. It's a V8. As you can see, it's a fairly tight fit, but most things are, are quite easily accessible uh, for service purposes. Oil filter, spark plugs, air filter and so on, quite easy to get at. This car, I would say, under under the bonnet is average for what you would see, or maybe above average because it's it's been painted at some stage fairly recently. Um, look around for anything that's leaking. Uh, check that there's nothing that looks old, perished, split, that sort of thing. Um, generally, you'll you'll know if something's not right. And when you start them up, is there a a specific concern? Are we looking for puffs of blue smoke or noise from tappets or...? Well, with any, as with any engine, yes, tappets, they should not be noisy. Uh, as with any engine, you're looking for smoke or um, something coming out of the exhaust uh, moisture that shouldn't be there. Um, these engines have run very quietly and there shouldn't be any strange tapping noises or clicks or whirs. Or we do get a, a, a regular injector. Uh, click, don't you, when, they're, a, when they're ticking over. A little, little mm. ticking. And also the air conditioning tends to make odd noises on occasion, doesn't it, whilst it's resetting, particularly with some of the older cars. Yeah, the, there's, the HVAC system is quite complex, but it's also, in a way, quite basic. It's complex in that there's a lots of parts that uh, make it work, mixing the cold air, the hot air and so on. But it's basic in the fact that it's all actu actuated by vacuum from the engine, and there are valves which open and shut with vacuum, which unlike an electric valve, they can either be shut or open. So they make a noise, they bang. Mm. And uh, that's just a... Uh, I know in my own car, you'll, you know, if you, if you start it up and get the aircon going, sometimes you can hear it readjusting. More so you would do on a, on a you know, modern car from you know, yeah. the, the, you know, the, the 2010s onwards, really. I noticed there's a little valve here, or a, rather a gauge. Um, in yellow. Is that a standard item? Uh, no, it's not standard. Um, the owner has added that on and it's a very good indication of what's going on in the fuel injection system. Um, these two rails either side are the fuel injection rails and that will show you the pressure that's um, inside those rails. And so if, if the pressure is wrong or if it's dropping quite quickly after you turn off the engine then you know if something's leaking, it's not running at its optimum. They're often added uh, as an aftermarket. So if, if 
if that's in a car, are you thinking either it's got problems or you think this is a very cautious owner? No, I would say normally it's a cautious owner, although why he's got one spark plug cap actually pulled out, I have no idea. Yeah, um, one failed apparently, he hadn't get time to... So he left it there, so he left the old one there. Okay. Did it small, I think. <laughs> <laughs> he did say, I wonder who's the first person to spot that. <laughs> well, there you go, Paul Lacey is the first person to spot it, and uh, probably blue Peter badges in the offing will uh, <laughs> we'll write up. It's a useful uh, indicator, but is it something you'd leave in place for? To be honest, no. No. I, I've, I've heard that you shouldn't leave them in place. I, I'm sorry, because Simon is standing there and he's got one on his car. <laughs> but they have been known. Obviously, they've yeah. got the full fuel pressure inside them. They, they often have a glass face. Can they break or If they sp break or... and start leaking, then you'll get a spray of fuel underneath the bonnet, which obviously is not good, potentially. Right. So, Simon, do you want to fire your beastie up? Literally, yeah, yeah, and, and we'll we'll um, we'll yeah, have with we'll spraying have, and we'll have a little listen. I, I do I do drive everywhere with a posse of people with fire extinguishers. Just and, in and case. maybe Paul can just talk us through the uh, you know what's going on in the bonnet. Is that okay? Can you do that for us? Oh right, oh yeah. I think while Simon's getting ready to uh, fire up, Paul explained service history absolutely vital. I think the other thing is patience. You shouldn't rush out and buy a nine two eight. You need to be prepared to look at a lot of cars before, unless you've owned one before, you know what you're looking at. Oh, we're just about to fire up, Vince, so uh, let's have a go. listen. You'll see that gauge is down at zero at the moment. Oh, are they? Do you want to just give it a little bit of sound, Simon, you know, just for the, uh, just for the hell of it? Radio one. Foot, foot, please. So the sound of a healthy 9 to 8? Absolutely, that's exactly how it should sound. You can, you can tell there's no odd noises. It, it revs and drops back to idle exactly as it should. And um, perfect. If you find one that's a good price that looks like that, then buy it. Right. Let's just have a little look at the interiors. Who's the, uh, who's the interior expert that can take us through the... Well, Simon's had his interior re redone, so... OK. Well, I'm, I just want to take us through the, the basic 9 to 8 interior, then maybe we'll have a quick look at Simon's. But if you had, you've had it all refurbished, have you, Simon? So, um, the leather was actually good condition. So what I've done is uh, one easy thing to try and stop wear is the seat backs. Stop right. the seat backs round. Right. So the front seats aren't handed. So. Okay, Vince, do you want to just take us through the silver one, and let's have a look at the inside, and just talk us through what to uh, what to concern ourselves about. Let's assuming that he's got it open. He hasn't. He hasn't. Um, typically. Well, well, let's have a look at the the well, radius forehead. You, you can actually see here through the window. You've got a lot of reflection. So yeah. let's just go through here. Can we just have a quick look at your car from the inside? Thank you. A very typical area of uh, wear is, is the driver's side uh, bolster. This has got the sports seats with this uh, deep um, uh, bulge, which when you get in and out of the car, you can't help but rub against this this uh, uh, area so that's often a weakness um, creasing uh, do, we, do we need to be worried about creasing when we see not tears but just general you know creases in, I, I in think a... I think some people would say it's a sort of patina of its age and, and can it be with uh, with leather uh, food be uh, be brought up a little bit perhaps. I think a leather specialist would be able to do wonderful things. Uh, these seats aren't in too bad a condition, they've got some creasing, uh, could do with a little bit of cleaning, but generally in quite good shape. Um, so what, what else are concerns from the interior when you look at the cars when you've been out looking at, uh, at buying? Uh, one, one little weakness uh, that you can see, uh, would not obviously, is that the, the rear headlining, uh, you have the sun visors for the rear seat passengers. And the headlining just above that, yeah, yeah, yeah. where the hatch uh, rotates up, you can sometimes get a bit of leakage on the rubber of the hatch. And the uh, effect of that is that the hardboard liner of the heading um, sags. So you can end up with a rather sort of and we, and we've got, gap. And we've got, got the sunroof uh, a motor um, housing here. And often I've seen those that have been detached, the clips haven't been retained. 
and sadly they've uh, been worse for wearing some water gets in them as well. Yeah. In terms of the carpets, uh, if we've got wet carpets, is it something to concern ourselves about? Uh, that would be worrying because generally the cars should be fairly watertight. Uh, you, if you do get a bit of wear on the uh, rubber liners to windows and seals, they are all available. Not cheap, but they are. all these parts generally can be sourced. Um, the variants on the dash, uh, this one would be fairly typical as a, a vinyl leatherette uh, finish uh, interior. So seats leather, but a leatherette. Um, dashboard and uh, uh, headings to the doors uh, you can get splitting uh, with um, sun damage and uh, some of them of course got leather dashes where and which is have. typically you can you can identify because they've got a, a horizontal stitching halfway through very nice and they and smell slightly different as well oddly yeah. you can t obviously uh, the, the the full leather interiors were fairly rare because that's a big option in terms of pricing um, if you happen to find a nice car that had got that, that's a bonus. But you know, you, it's not something you would seek out necessarily. So if we find a car that's mechanically good, bodily good, but interior is a little bit past its uh, sell-by date, is it something you'd consider? I think so. Um, interior parts can be repaired. Uh, there are some specialists. Ironically, for a car made in Germany, a huge number of them were exported to America, and there is a, a huge uh, fraternity of 9 to 8 owners in America, so there's actually better uh, aftermarket suppliers of special parts uh, in America than there are in the UK, where there just isn't the volume to justify them setting up business. So, uh, for my own car, I have imported parts from America, um, some of which are uh, possibly built to a, a better quality than the original Porsche part. I'm thinking the radiator um, uh, in particular, the original part made by Bear and badged Porsche um, has plastic headers uh, to which the multiple connections are made. These are complex radiators uh, varying from the simple two um, connections for water to up to six connections for gearbox oil and engine oil cooling all in the one radiator matrix. Um, these are more akin to Formula One racing cars than, um, than standard cars. They're very expensive but you can buy all aluminium units uh, from uh, aftermarket uh, specialists in the States that ironically are cheaper than buying the replacement part from Porsche. Right, so I think the mantra is, uh, you know, don't be put off with an interior that's slightly worn. The parts can be acquired, uh, but certainly if there's damp carpets, uh, we should be very concerned and also check for any damage to the headlining front and rear in, c in case of water ingress. So I think we'll wrap it there now, Vince, and then we'll maybe in one last one, we'll talk about the prices in today's market. Thank you, Vince. You're welcome.